Amen. Amen. We are continuing our study in the book of Acts this week. And uh, last week, we considered the historic account of the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we considered the way that he prepared his disciples for his mission. And this morning, we're going to see how the church, this baby church, responded to what Jesus told them. And if you remember, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem. He said, go and, and wait for the, the promise of the Father. What we see from the very beginning are the fundamental characteristics of the church being exercised. Put in other words, we see the church being the church. So I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 26, and I am going to ask the congregation to please stand for the reading of God's holy word. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in his ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akadama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place and cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Beloved, God's holy, infallible, inerrant word for God's holy people. Let's receive it as such. You may be seated. In the beginning of the chapter, Jesus told them that they were to go and be witnesses in Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But before that, for now, he says, I want you to go back to Jerusalem. Don't depart from there. Don't leave. And wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. However, as we can see, waiting does not mean do nothing. 
Most, most of you are, know this. Before I was a pastor, I managed apartment buildings. And uh, the last place I did that was in the city of Boston. And so there I had colleagues, um, many of them, they, they managed much bigger buildings that I managed. Um, and I remember this one person who, uh, he managed a, a, one of those 25-story high-rises in the city of Boston, and it was a brand new building. And he had this, this, this story about, you know, they just built this building, and for months, he would get the same complaint over and over again about how long the elevators took to come down. Same complaint over and over again. And, and so a brand new building calls the elevator company in, they come in, they, they check it, I was like, it works great, it works the way it's supposed to. He calls a second elevator company in, it works fine, it's, it's good. And then one of the technicians, he's actually like one of the assistants of, of the guy that's actually doing the work, he said, hey, you know what you should think about doing? You should put some mirrors here in the lobby, outside the elevators. And you hear that, and you know, my friend, he, he kind of laughed and whatever. But the complaints keep on coming, and he says, they do it. From the moment they put the mirrors in the elevator, the, the lobby, so that you know, you're, you're there, you're waiting for the, lo for the elevator, and you're able to look at yourself, you're able to look at the other people next to you, not one complaint. Not one complaint. And in our industry, we lived and died on those reviews that you see online. No more. Why is that? We'll get back to that in a moment. But the disciples here, they're not idle as they wait. They're waiting together. Beginning with this section in the book of Acts, there begins a pattern that we're going to see in the upcoming chapters. It begins to emerge here. You know, Jesus has ascended. Mind you, they've been with him. He's, they've been following him for years now. And in one sense, they're, they're on their own now, in one sense. And then we see verse 14. With one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together. And we're going to see this, that, that language, we're going to see that pop up over and over again in the next few chapters of the book of Acts. It's like this pattern. We see them doing this, then there's a response, there's some action, and then guess what? They go back to doing this, devoting themselves to one accord, praying continually. We'll see it in the, the end of chapter 2. We're going to see this at the beginning of chapter 4. We'll see it again in the middle of chapter 5. It's almost as if Luke like, pauses the narrative, but it's happening that they, they gather one accord, praying. And gathering says something about who we are in the world, right? What do people that are unbelievers think about what we do here on Sunday mornings? What do you think they say? Some of us know what they say. They may think, well, they have nothing better to do, right? And they're right. We have nothing better. There is not anything better to do than what happens on Sunday morning in worship. And then Luke begins to tell us who these people are who have nothing better to do. Is listening to the core group of the baby church. Verse 13 and 14 lists the disciples. Eleven. No longer twelve. Judas Iscariot is no longer with them. Just to clarify, there's two Judases. There's Judas, the son of James, and then there's Judas Iscariot, and he's dead by this time. And if we think about it, if we look back, you know, there's no reason, there, there's a good reason why Jesus told 12. This goes back to Genesis, right? Sons of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. This is, again, God fulfilling his promises. He's showing us that I'm fulfilling my promises to you. And 
This word apostle means sent one. However, it's one that is sent with authority. The authority comes with the office of apostle, someone appointed by Jesus to speak on his behalf. As we see at the end, it had to be somebody who, 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 who's, who's been a witness to the resurrected Lord. Someone who has been appointed by Jesus. Hence the reason why we don't have apostles today. Capital A, Office of Apostle. Should be noted and significant that women are included in the core group of the church and listed here. They're not just part of the 120, the crowd. When we consider it's an ancient document in the ancient world, with Jewish ancestry here, it's something significant. And we're going to hear about women, a lot of them. Rhoda in chapter 2. We're going to hear about Tabitha. We're going to hear about Lydia in chapter 16. This, however, will be the last time we hear of Mary in the entire New Testament. Oh, and Jesus had brothers, yeah. One of his brothers, James, not one of the twelve, James would end up being one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. His other half-brother, Jude, would write one of the epistles at the end of the Bible, Jude. It's in this core group where we, where first, most fundamentally, we see the church gathered, seeking the Lord and waiting together. Um, there doesn't seem to be much organization yet. And, and there's no particular mention of teaching even yet. There's no mention of breaking bread yet. But what we see even before those things, we see unanimity together. They're united. Not united for unity's sake. See, the togetherness of the people of God abiding together, holding on to what they heard from Jesus and holding on to each other. The church being the church. One of the things we see over and over again in this cycle about this community is that it's of one mind. Some of our translations say one accord the reason why I entitled the series On Mission Together. Even as the apostles and disciples, we're going to read this later on, they're, they're going to eventually, they're going to disperse to the end of the world. Even then, there's going to be a striving for unity among them. They understand that it's critical for the mission of the church. Now, let's be clear. This does not mean they all agreed on everything. Okay? There's a difference. Think about it. A group of 120 people in the ancient world. We got to eat. When are we going to pray? How are we going to pray? Which hymn are we going to sing? They didn't always agree on everything. That's not what's, what's happening here. And there was definitely not unity for unity's sake. But there was a desire to be of one mind. Unity in the gospel. Unity in the fact that God has made a way to be reconciled to him. The only way, and they've seen it, and they've experienced it, 
And now Jesus is telling them that you're going to be the ones to carry that. Me? Guys, we got to get on the same page about this. We got to make sure we're together on this. You have your differences. I get it. You don't like that. I don't like that. But we know what's... This isn't unity for unity's sake. It's unity because this is the way of truth, the light. This is the only way. We, and, and now it's on us. Let's get together about this. I'm emphasizing this. The reason I realize the last year has been really hard. And I realize, for instance, I suspect, I, I don't hear a lot about it, but I realize that some people have different opinions regarding things like masks and difference of opinions with regards to singing after the service. I realize that. Everybody does, really. I realize that some of us look at empty pews here, and we may be thinking about, man, so-and-so, he's pretty young. They're pretty young. Why aren't they here? We're thinking those things, aren't we? I am. I realize that some of us are concerned about what's going to happen after the pandemic. What's, you know, what's our church going to look like even after this whole thing is over? And then I, we're, we're able to track how many people are watching on live stream. I see how many people are doing it. Actually, for instance, like last week, we had, so we had about 47 people here. We had like 35 devices watching. That means we had more people at home live streaming than we had here present. That's encouraging to me. And then I get emails from people afterwards that I didn't see on Sunday morning, and some longer than others. And that was really encouraging to me. And I say that only to encourage you all and encourage those that are home right now by themselves who don't know. Now, let me be clear. I, I'm in no way saying that streaming is a replacement for the physical gathering of the saints. At the same time, if you're, if you're streaming because you're concerned, I get it, and, and I support that. We support you, and we, we celebrate that you're here. But if you, if you do need to stream, I would say make a commitment to it. Make a commitment, 1030 Sunday mornings. It's, it's for your good. It's also for the good of the church. I realize the t temptation to apathy would be greater. It's easy just to put it off. In some ways, it's also a test of the spirit. A spirit that unites us. And from what I see, the Spirit is doing its work within us, for the most part, really. And I'm encouraged by it. And so here in the book of Acts, we see the church being the church gathered. We see the church being the church of one mind in the gospel. And then we see the church being fed with the word of God. The church was not idle. They gathered to pray. It says continually, is the, 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 the Greek word there. Implicitly, we also see that the church is gathered reading scriptures. Verse 15, it was in those days that Peter got up. It seems like they had questions about Judas. How could he? And then they find out what, what he did to himself as a whole. 
horrible. And so they're, you know, talking amongst themselves, like, what, Judas, he was one of, you know, he was with Jesus for three years, he lived with them. You and I witness evil and see evil happening in the world. And here, when we're talking about the crucifixion, we're talking about the greatest act of evil ever. The putting to death of God's only son, completely blameless, greatest act of evil ever. And Judas was the one to betray him. What Peter realized in searching God's word and looking through the scriptures, Peter provides a lesson for us as we encounter evil, as we see the fallenness, and as even as we deal with our own sin. The key verse is verse 16. The scripture had to be fulfilled. And the lesson is, even the worst evil in the world does not happen outside of the superintendence, foreknowledge, and the decree of God himself. It was on Wednesday afternoon that I was working on this little section here and watching the news. And then I think back to this whole last year. Naturally, I still think, I don't know what's gonna happen. St. Augustine, was a pastor and a bishop, I think 400s, so about 1,600 years ago. He was in North Africa, and it's right around the time of the fall of Rome. A Rome in at least name only considered itself a Christian empire. And people would walk up to Augustine and say, they, they would leave Rome. They, they came to live in, in Carthage and where he was in North Africa and because they fled. They knew what was, they saw what was coming. How could God let this happen? Augustine knew his Bible. He knew the scriptures. He said, God does, God does not raise up citadels of stone and marble for us. Outside of this world, he raises up citadels of the Holy Spirit for us. Citadels of love which could never collapse, which will forever stand in glory when this world has been reduced to ashes. Rome has collapsed, and your hearts are outraged by this? Rome was built by men like you. Since when did you believe that men had the power to build things that are eternal? Your souls, filled with the light of the Holy Spirit, will not perish. What St. Augustine was trying to teach his people, and what I think we need to be reminded of, is that our security does not come from the nation with which we live. And none of us want to see this happening. In fact, we're called to pray for our leaders. We're called that they would be, to, to pray for the fact that they would all be saved, that we would live quiet and peaceful lives. We're called to work towards order, to, to take part in society, to do justice, to, to point out and to do truth while we're here. But at the same time, we do it knowing full well that we are pilgrims in this world, that this is not our home. We are, in a sense, exiled in this world. And while we're here, yes, we do. We, 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 we make lives, we build homes, we serve. 
But knowing that God's coming to remake it all, we can't place our hope in this. And th this has been you know, pulling on my heart this week, too. What's the song we sing, right? Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Anything else is like sinking sand. Sinking sand. Whether it be tomorrow or 100 years from now or 500 years from now, there at one point will no longer be a United States of America at some point. Hopefully not for a long time. But that's just the reality. But our home, the mansions that the Lord prepares for us will be there forever. What we should be most mindful for when we read about what Peter said here about Judas is that nothing can stray from the providence of God. Even the most intimate of betrayals is not a surprise to God. And guess what? It does nothing to God's plan. In fact, in one sense, we can say all that happens furthers God's plan. So when this group, this baby church, hear what Peter said, realizing what happened with Judas, that it was all part of God's plan, they went forward. They moved ahead as a church. The church proceeded to find out who was the Lord going to then appoint to serve as an apostle. They proceeded, they moved on. The church being the church. We saw the announcement about the annual meeting on the 24th. Lord willing, we will be electing a new deacon. And then here's one, here's an announcement that's not in the bulletin yet, it hasn't been announced yet. Lord willing, we say everything Lord willing now, don't we? Yeah, it's a good place to be. Lord willing, February 7th, we will be having an ordination service here will be ordaining two deacons. Ken Underwood was elected last year. Bob DeStefano this year, maybe. Invited a brick titan to come and preach for us that day. In the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of civic unrest, in the midst of transition, we're moving forward. Church being the church. In these very early days, Jesus had told them to wait for the promise of the Father. Next week, we're going to see what that, how, what, what, how, how that happens. I'm excited about that. However, in another sense, we are also still waiting right now, 2,000 years later. We're waiting for the return. What the angels told the disciples, that he who is ascending, you will see him come down in the same way. And we're, that's what we're waiting for right now. But as we wait, we are not idle. Back to my elevator story. Let me hold up a mirror for you for a moment as we wait. A little over a month ago, Gallup released the latest poll which revealed America's overall mental health ratings. Some of you have seen this. And it shouldn't be a surprise that within the last year, the overall mental health of Americans has declined significantly across the board. The isolation, trouble, the economy, pandemic, 
loss of life, they would do that to you. Which should also not be a surprise to us is that within that same report, there's one group that stands out that hasn't declined that much. In fact, some reports say has had the opposite effect. You want to know what that group is? Those who frequently attend church. makes sense for us theologically. It makes sense for us biblically. God intended us to be in community with him and with one another. We need one another. We need this. Second thing I'll point out as a reflection, and, and this is just, this week I was just rejoiced and praising God for his faithfulness. 2020 just ended. I got the financial statement from our church. I was amazed. Do you know that our giving went up more, was was higher in 2020 than it was in 2019? Praise God. God's faithfulness of all years. Really? Thanks be to God. I'll tell you today what I told you last week. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Jesus is on his throne of thrones right now, interceding for us, his people. King of kings, and then he calls us his bride. Praise God. Pray with me. Father, we cannot even begin to try to repay you for what you have done. We fall short, so short, of the mark that you are, the the, the holiness and the transcendence that you are. And yet you came down to us, you condescend to us, you care for us, And so we just say hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And we ask you that you would help us in this mission that you have put us on. Help us as we seek to serve you, glorify you with the gospel. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we come.